In the second half of 2023, a meme became viral online about why men love ancient Rome. Beyond attracting media attention and speculation as to why so many men think and love ancient Rome, I found something even more fascinating about this one rarely mentioned in the discourse. Loving and thinking about ancient Rome is not new and nor is it exclusive to our time period. So much of Western history is shaped by the legacy of Rome for better or for worse. This video could have been titled Why We Think About Ancient Rome, but that's not very interesting because of course we think about Rome. Rather, I'm interested in those who love ancient Rome or aspects of it. This could include filmmakers, politicians, painters, lawyers, authors, monarchs, and theologians. Here, I will explain the popularity and love commanded by ancient Rome. There are five arguments. Rome is who we are. Rome challenges us. Rome is everywhere. Rome is dramatic and fascinating. And finally, Rome is power. Ultimately, I frame ancient Rome as an entity still existing within us, like lava in a volcano. I'm not interested in trying to prove Rome is progressive and only worth studying to validate our theories of enlightenment liberalism. History is not a breakfast buffet, but you can grab anything you'd like and ignore the rest. Throughout my five arguments, I will not only draw on antiquity, but also its reception in modernity from the Renaissance to the present. Please note, my interest is not just about men who love and think about ancient Rome. My scope covers the Western world in its entirety. Near the end, I'll provide tips to enhance your study and reading of ancient Rome in the hope of a deeper appreciation. Again, I am not interested in lecturing you or anyone about the right or wrong ways in talking about ancient Rome. Regardless of your politics or worldview, we can talk about ancient Rome without distortion but also, we can look to ancient Rome for direction and meaning. I'm Madeline Rose Jones, and I study history, literature, and culture. Welcome to Snowy Fictions. In AD 476, the Western Roman Empire fell, with Romulus being overthrown by a barbarian leader. The previous centuries had brought enigmatic figures to Western history, Octavian, Mark Antony, Julius Caesar and Constantine the Great, to name a few. Roman society also meant advancements in law, urban planning, military tactics and literature. Ancient Rome, therefore, commands a certain respect and attention from modern audiences. There's a grandeur to Rome, which is not found elsewhere. But that doesn't tell the whole story about why we love and are fascinated by ancient Rome. Sure, Rome has provided plenty for us Westerners. As the cliche goes, one can find roads, baths, wine, culture and technology within the Roman Empire. Monty Python references aside, there is certainly an obsession and devotion to Rome throughout modern history. There's obviously the Renaissance, which I will discuss later, but I must mention what came after, which includes the Third Republic, the Third Reich, Mussolini's Italy, and even the United States of America, all which enjoy a connection to Rome. Perhaps this suggests a desire among us to become a Roman ourselves. Even before the Renaissance, Europe is soaked with Rome. Both the Holy Roman Empire and Byzantium are interested in Roman ideals and build upon them. When Constantinople fell to the Ottoman Empire in the 15th century, the idea of Rome shifted to Moscow, the now capital of the Russian Federation. Moscow was deemed the third Rome, the spiritual successor to the legacy left by both Rome and Constantinople. Interestingly, those living in Byzantium considered themselves Romans. We also have a rich literary and artistic tradition in the Middle Ages, which builds on the work from antiquity. As stated in previous videos, the medieval concept of chivalry is heavily derived 
from the Roman Empire. Western history is truly soaked in ancient Rome. There has rarely been a time in the West where her people did not think and feel about the Roman Empire. In many ways, learning about ancient Rome is how we learn about ourselves. There are, maybe, two sets of keys to Rome, the one given to St. Peter and the other through learning and embracing our own Roman heritage. Another reason why we love ancient Rome is we can explore our personal interests within it. If you are interested in military history and tactics, then Rome delights with famous battles, legions and conquests. Or perhaps you like politics and law, which Rome delivers with Livy and Cicero. Ancient Rome is ultimately a playground. You can certainly explore your own interests within it. There is simply so much to study, to learn and to engage with. I consider myself a writer on religious history and with Rome, one encounters various cults, Mithraism, Hermeticism, Zoroastrianism, Judaism and of course Christianity. This dynamicism is terrific and also brings new personalities into the ancient Rome arena of appreciation. So often, ancient Rome fans and lovers are simplified as having basic or even false interests. I've certainly seen judgment holstered in the direction of those who like ancient Rome, and to me this is deeply unfair. Ancient Rome is wonderful for lovers of history, literature and culture, which I'm sure, if you are watching this channel, you certainly appreciate. Ancient Rome is part of Western history, sure, but it is not a mere footnote. There are aspects of Rome which are confronting and at times controversial. To paraphrase Mary Beard, the context in which we view the Romans and incorporate them into our contemporary lives says more about us than them. There are three ways ancient Rome challenges us, with violence, with Christ and with death. The violent parts of ancient Rome are easy enough to understand. We only have to look at the villainous Nero or the cruel Caligula. Roman lives were marred and shaped with violence and even when peace ensured, it came at a brutal cost. The historian Tom Holland discusses this in his recent bestseller, Pax. Another aspect of Roman life, one mentioned by the journalists Louise Perry and Helen Dale, is the killing of infants and the glorification of suicide. These are not easy subjects, and rightfully so. We, in the contemporary West, have our own conception about death and murder, which has shaped our laws. That said, the so-called evils of the Roman Empire are the subject of discussion and debate. One of my favourite YouTubers, Metatron, produced an excellent video on whether the ancient Romans were evil. I've linked these below. Yet, Violence is not unique to ancient Rome. Other civilizations, whether in antiquity or in modernity, are rife with spilled blood. Likewise, the Roman attitudes towards death, funerary customs and memorializing others are not so bizarre compared to other moments in world history. Arguably, the most challenging aspect of ancient Rome is Christianity. It was in Rome and through Roman power that Christianity went from a small movement into Judea to the shaping force in Byzantium and the Latin West, which built the world we have today. The rise of Christianity is not without controversy for ancient Rome lovers. It's not uncommon for certain classic writers to frame the rise of Christianity as antagonistic to the true Rome, or that Christianity sought to destroy the classical world. This is shown in Catherine Nixie's book the Darkening Age, but also in a debate between A.C. Grayling and Tom Holland. That said, the most famous example is the decline and fall of the Roman Empire by Edward Gibbons from the 18th century. The idea you can have an ancient Rome divorced from Christianity has certainly shaped attitudes towards both. Gibbons, in particular, is scathing towards Christianity, perhaps uncharitably so. Later, writers on antiquity such as Nietzsche, would adopt a similarly hostile stance. Yet, ancient Rome is also challenging to Christians, although sympathetic to Christianity. The Roman world has a violence and cruelty to it, which is simply divorced from, say, the Sermon on the Mount. 
Roman religion, so often crudely simplified to mere paganism, does not win the devotion of Christians easily. That said, it is possible for anyone, regardless of their religion or philosophical worldview, to enjoy and love ancient Rome, but it does seem where Rome goes, so does controversy. Paris is a world famous city not typically mentioned in the context of Roman history, and why would it? Paris would not reach her glory until the Middle Ages, and then modernity made her even greater. When we think of Roman cities, we think of Alexandria, Ephesus, Constantinople, and of course Rome. After all, it was these cities who witnessed the glory and heights of Imperial Rome. Gaius Octavius did not really think of Paris, he thought of Rome, but Parisians have and continue to think of ancient Rome. In the fifth arrondissement, one encounters the Pantheon, a neoclassical building where famous Frenchmen and women are buried. This takes cues from various Greco-Roman structures, like of course the Pantheon in Rome. Nearby, in the Latin Quarter, a tourist may encounter the Sorbonne, typically known in history as the University of Paris. Founded in the High Middle Ages, the curriculum derived from the seven liberal arts, the quadrivium and the trivium. Medieval education enjoyed ancient roots. Roman writers, particularly theologians, were studied and analysed. Today, the Sorbonne is a world-leading university for the study of ancient Rome, as well as Greece and Oriental affairs. That's not all about Paris and ancient Rome. In the Louvre, there are spellbinding examples of neoclassical statues of Roman emperors and figures, particularly in the Richelieu wing. Others feature in the Museum Rodin. Remember, Paris hardly featured in the ancient world and was actually a growing Gallo-Roman town named Lutetia. In the centuries following Rome's collapse, Paris actively chose to embrace Romanness and incorporated many ideals and ideas from the most famous ancient empire. She's not alone either. Great cities across the West, from Berlin to London and even Washington DC, have the legacy of Rome etched into their famed white walls. Rome is everywhere. We find it in our cities, our laws, Christianity, neoclassical architecture, within European languages, in our rhetoric, and of course, in popular culture. It is impossible to have the modern West without Rome. Those with a keen mind on European history will encounter ancient Rome, even if that's not the field in question. Take the Italian Renaissance, which saw the dramatic and gorgeous reception of antiquity in philosophy, sculpture, painting, political thought and architecture. St. Peter's Basilica, quite possibly the finest church in all of Christendom, took inspiration from the Roman Pantheon. We can also see the Roman Empire in Michelangelo's sculptures and paintings. The Renaissance is a terrific example because during this time, the city of Rome rose from centuries of decline and into the specular splendor she is today. Modern history is rich in examples of Roman reception from revolutionary and Napoleonic France to the Third Reich and Fascist Italy. Whilst less politically charged, Georgian England also witnessed grand scholarship and architecture relating to the Roman Empire, as we can see in Bath, a city in southwest England. Historically, the West is fascinated by Rome and is both haunted and enchanted by this empire. It is in our nature to think of Rome. There are many examples to engage with Roman history, whether it is a short documentary on YouTube, a book by Tom Holland, or at an exhibition at a local gallery. Rome's presence continues in the West. These opportunities to learn about Rome frequently blossom into a deep appreciation. It's not so much, why do we love ancient Rome? But why wouldn't we love ancient Rome? In 2000, filmmakers were enchanted and thrilled by Ridley Scott's Academy Award winning film Gladiator. In it, we follow Maximus, who seeks vengeance. It's a brilliant movie, and certainly one of my favourites. Interestingly, Gladiator is also heartfelt and epic, and captures the feel associated with other blockbuster films like Chariots of Fire, Titanic, Schindler's List, 
and Dances with Wolves. Whilst this type of filmmaking sadly isn't so popular now, Gladiator still remains a beloved movie. This is obviously due to it being an absolutely fantastic movie, but we shouldn't ignore the Roman imagery and setting either. From the Tuscan countryside to the Eternal City, Gladiator emphasises the lasting legacy Rome has left. In modern history, countless storytellers have explored ancient Rome through fiction and drama, with notable examples being I, Claudius, and even The Secret History by Donna Tartt. The recent fantasy blockbuster novel The Will of the Many by James Islington proves that the ideas of Rome often blend nicely with contemporary storytelling, and, of course, I must mention the bard, William Shakespeare, responsible for Julius Caesar, among others. Rome has a drama to it, an energy built from the flames of warriors, emperors and spies. Ancient Rome commands our attention and keeps it. Modern storytelling, whether from the Anglosphere or in continental Europe, keeps to this tradition. The Roman poetry found in Horace, Ovid and Virgil also leaves an impression. In the Italian Middle Ages, the famed poet Dante composed the Divine Comedy where Virgil guides our protagonist into Inferno to Paradiso, encountering medieval and ancient figures across Europe and Asia. Rome's dramatic, wild nature comes with a sense of timelessness, but it isn't just stories, poetry and fiction, although those help in depicting Rome. Sculpture, I must mention, is a wonderful example. I previously mentioned the Louvre, but again, we need to take a closer look. These neoclassical statues do not have bland poses, rather, these emperors and lovers stand proud or in dynamic movement as if being Roman were a dance. There's a rhythm to Rome, and it's not uncommon today for politicians in the West to reference or inspire references to Roman leaders. You truly cannot separate the contemporary West from Rome. Here is a blunt and unsettling reason why so many in the West love Rome. Power. This is the dark underbelly to so many dynasties, empires and kingdoms, but it's also a fact of life. Classical liberalism, which is heavily Western, prides itself on valuing rationalism and being above the power games and schemes found in monarchies, totalitarian governments and organised religion. But Westerners are still human beings. Power, like torchlight, draws us in. There are many talking points about Roman power. Terrific military victories, the success of the Latin language, prestigious museums, and the appeal of a classical education attuned to Greece and Rome. Today, the city of Rome is the greatest city to ever exist, and this didn't come from nothing. You have the Trevi Fountain, the Vatican, the Colosseum, and whilst Rome is not the sole city of the Roman Empire, it is by far the most associated, the heart of Rome, so to speak. When we discuss ancient Rome, we give a timeline with a beginning, middle and end. Yet, there is no end to our love and focus on Rome. Whether we like it or not, power matters. There's a prestige, a cool factor to ancient Rome. This, of course, won't explain all of our love, but we look at Romans and we see who we are, who we were, who we may become and who we shouldn't be and who we ought to be. I do not intend to frame ancient Rome's power as all about status or winning cool points with friends. Ironically, Roman history emphasises the power of other empires and groups, whether it's Hellenization or the barbarian tribes. Rome has bitter enemies too. The Jews of today are not eager to forget the destruction and bloodshed that came out of the Second Temple in Jerusalem in AD 70. Rome's power may be eternal, but it can also bend and yield at times. The Roman Empire is not the only pre-modern force which dominates in our Western minds. We have many ancestors. Egypt, Macedonia, the Sumerians, the Celts, the Assyrians and the Hunts. Yet Rome perhaps is our favourite. She is our mother among aunts, and if we love and learn about her, maybe some of her power will go to us too. Because you are watching this video, there is a strong chance you love and appreciate ancient Rome. 
which is terrific. Having a connection and interest in antiquity is nothing to be ashamed of. Unfortunately, modernity is stacked with arrogant individuals who look on the past with contempt and act morally righteous. That's not you and it's not me either. I have several tips though on enhancing your study and appreciation of ancient Rome. Obviously, these are not compulsory, but hopefully provide food for thought. First, defend your interest in ancient Rome. Don't let anyone tell you you're racist, sexist or violent, nor should you feel pressure to make ancient Rome and classics more specifically, more politically correct or corporate friendly. You may not have studied ancient Rome in either high school or university and that's okay too. The history discipline is worthless if only a select few can talk about it. Secondly, consider broadening your studies of ancient Rome to incorporate other historical periods and empires within relevance. This could include the Roman Republic, Byzantium, ancient Greece or the Persian Empire. Understanding how Rome fits in and perhaps challenges other great pre-modern civilizations is also important. Much to my delight, there is growing research on Roman contact with ancient China. Geography brings us to my third point, which is to encourage sophisticated knowledge in a certain region of the Roman Empire. Many of those interested in Rome narrow in on a certain area like Judea, Gaul or Britain, or perhaps a thematic approach is more suitable. You could read more about religion in ancient Rome or art, and perhaps a concept like Hellenization. Doing this will help your understanding of how Rome changed and developed over time. Ancient Rome was not a static civilization, so it's best to uncover the many conflicts and turmoils within the empire. My next point is to question the classifications of ancient and medieval history. Here, I've defined ancient Rome as ending in the 5th century AD, mostly for the sake of brevity, but not everyone agrees. Some argue Rome lived on in the Byzantium Empire, or that the rise of Islam in the Middle East was the final chapter for Rome. This is all, of course, understandable. History thrives on debate and controversy, but far too many treat ancient and medieval history as two very different categories and thus frame the classical world as some pristine epoch of Western civilization until those darn Christians or Muslims came along and ruined it, hence the Dark Ages. This is reductive. The Middle Ages, as stated prior, came from antiquity and drew strength and legitimacy from ancient Rome. That's honestly why I struggle with Edward Gibbons and Catherine Nixie, they fall into the trap of idealizing one part of history, then demonizing what followed next. It's certainly fine and encouraged to love ancient Rome and to see so much value in it. Heck, I'll even go further. There is no problem in wanting Western civilization to remain quite Roman, nor is there an issue in defending certain Romans or seeing yourself as a Roman. But do question bombastic narratives about Rome's decline, which seek to establish a strict binary between the Middle Ages and antiquity. On a side note, that's also why I appreciate late antiquity, the historical period roughly between the 3rd to 8th century AD. Finally, be thoughtful when making art or content for public viewing about Rome. I've given many terrific examples of modern art depicting the Roman Empire, from Renaissance paintings to contemporary literature, like The Secret History by Donatart. These were crafted with care and special insight into Rome and the legacy it leaves us. There's room for creative and unique interpretations of Roman history. I've listed some of my favorite YouTube videos on ancient Rome below. That said, I don't want to lecture endlessly about the correct ways to talk about ancient Rome. You'll get no scolding from me. Yet putting thought into how we talk and communicate about the past is surely important. In the Louvre, Paris, there are countless statues of Roman emperors created in the last 300 years. Nearly all are white and have dramatic proud poses. 
If you are into sculpture, perhaps you'd like to experiment with paints to give colour to, say, Octavian's clothing and hair. Or you could depict Constantine the Great with marble when he was a boy. Sure, the Roman Empire was multifaceted, but so were the people. We can reflect that in our content and art. What do you love about ancient Rome? Comment below. I'd love to read your thoughts and start a discussion. Consider subscribing to my channel as I make frequent videos about history, literature and culture. I also have a mailing list linked below and a blog where there are countless articles and essays which you may enjoy. I also have creative writing classes on Skillshare. Thanks for watching and I will see you soon.